That's your like cue. The class is starting. Yeah. The robotic voice. Okay. Well, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for gathering us together to worship you this morning. And we give you thanks for your mercies, which are newly given each day. Now we ask that you bless our time together as we uh, endeavor to be in your word, to learn more about you and, and what you would have us do as your people and as members of your church. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, we're on our handout from last time. We're going to be finishing the section on the third article of the Apostles' Creed and baptism. Um, so, and at the end of class, Carol, I can give you mine. Yeah, so I handed out the one that if we were on topic and I wasn't such a chatterbox, we would actually be doing. Um, but so we're gonna we're gonna really breeze through this this uh, the end of the Apostles' Creed stuff. Do you care if I do No, 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 come on okay. in. It's for new and recovering Lutherans. So yeah, recovering. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, so we started talking about the third article of the Apostles' Creed, and remember we had a person and an action for each, a primary person and primary action for each one, and we covered this, we're just going to review real quick. For the third article of the Creed, who's the primary person? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And what's the primary action we started to talk about last week? Sanctification, right? Which we learned was a fancy word for what? Being holy. Huh? Made holy. Being made holy, right? So the 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 holy life of the Christian is what sanctification refers to. Okay. Um so if you have your handout from last week, it's number three there. The Holy Spirit creates and establishes faith in the hearts of sinners. He works this in and through the gospel. Therefore, we do not bring ourselves to saving faith in Christ. Rather, we are brought to faith by God, the Spirit. And, uh, and then there's an excerpt from Luther, from the large catechism, a quote, where he basically says that, like, you and I on our own would really never know anything about Christ unless he chose to reveal it to us. And the person who does that re revealing is the Holy Spirit, right? So that the Holy Spirit is sort of the explanation for why you may know somebody who's read the Bible and their their response to it is this is all made up. And our response when we read it is this is God's word, right? The difference there is the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, there's a good example in the scriptures of that difference as well. What happens to the disciples when Jesus's mission uh, culminates in his death on the cross before they receive the spirit? What's their reaction to that? They're like, I knew it all along he was going to go to the cross and die. Or was it like a sense of loss? They thought everything was over and they were sort of scattered, right? Um, and when does that really come back is when um, they, they see the risen Jesus. And then he says to wait in Jerusalem until a helper is sent for you, right? And that helper is the Holy Spirit. And then when they receive the Holy Spirit, Peter, who denies Jesus when he's being questioned by a small group of people in a courtyard then preaches boldly to thousands of people. And it's not a, it's not a, a gimme easy sermon, right? He's telling them that like the person that they killed was in fact the Messiah, the son of God. Right? And the only difference there is the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, so the Holy Spirit is a big part of our life of holy living. Right? Um, so we used to just be, um, Peccator, which is the Latin word for sinner, like that's all we used to be, but now because of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are now um, simul eustus at Peccator, which is simultaneously saint and sinner, right? So when Paul's talking about the war within himself between the new spirit of God in him and his old sinful flesh, he's talking about the Holy Spirit's indwelling in us now that we are children of God. 
Um, that old sinful flesh, as we all know, still clings to us, right? We're not perfected yet. Um, we still sin. We still struggle with temptation. But the thing that protects us and pulls us away from that is the spirit of God that now lives in us. Um, so, <clears throat> so the big, the big emphasis in the, in the third article is um, this sense that we are not the ones doing the work of salvation, but it's a work being done to us. So uh, if you have the handout, if you go to the page before where it actually has the third article um, and says, what does this mean? Luther starts out by saying, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. And in the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. So we're very adamant about, as Lutherans about sticking with the Jesus stuff, right? So our worship is not going to change and look more and more progressive over time because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Uh, you don't need a different promise. You don't need a different gift of forgiveness. You don't need a different Jesus each week. You need the same one, right? Um, because this is an eternal thing that's happening to you. <clears throat> um, so uh, that is our goal with our understanding of the life of the Christian, that we are made holy not by the things that we do and generate from ourselves, but by the things that God is placing into us and using on us. Right? So our worship service is oriented around those things. It's not oriented around our singing of praise or our prayers. It's oriented around the stuff that God is doing. And those are our responses to what God is doing. Okay. Any questions about that so far? That's kind of a key thing. And I want to make sure that we understand that because like the Roman Catholic approach to that is pretty obviously different. They're pretty upfront about that you have a part to play in your justification, not your sanctification, but that being made right with God is mostly the work of Jesus, but a little bit the work of you, right? And we're saying that none of that work is you, right? Um, that it's all Jesus, okay? The second thing is uh, that evangelical backgrounds also struggle with this, and they're, it's less obvious. So the the Roman Catholics, they put it built in right at the front, so it's there, and, and they make no qualms about saying it, right? Uh, in evangelical circles, this is the part where they usually run into a snag, is they blur the justification and sanctification, and it'll, so what that sounds like typically is like, Jesus has saved you freely as a gift of his grace through the work that he's done, but a Christian really behaves this way if they have genuine faith, and so then what happens when you struggle because you're still, you're simultaneously saint and sinner. You're not a new, just a saint. When you struggle with progression in your Christian faith, then it leads to a crisis of faith that the promises of God are really for you, one, and two, that your faith is genuine. Because if I find myself not behaving or responding to God as I ought, then my thoughts, instead of being like, because I'm still a sinner and I need to repent of that, and, and refocus on, on, on what God is doing and trusting his promises. Instead, it leads to the thinking of, well, maybe my faith isn't genuine right? because I've tied, I've attached a condition to what? Or you lose it. Or you, well, and usually what precedes the losing of faith is the thinking that it's not real or it doesn't work, right? And so uh, let's say you're a young teacher in a difficult um, school district in an urban environment, and you've been raised to believe that as a Christian, you ought to think this way about other people and behave a certain way, right? We talk that way here, but we will then say that, like, it is inevitable that you're not always going to live up to your own standards, much less God's, and that's not a, that doesn't then mean you are no longer loved by him. It means that then you come and confess and you receive that, that the reminder of that promise and the living, the actual promise of forgiveness uh, because of what Christ has done. Um, but if you're taught to process that, and let's say you have a really rough day at school and you've been 
putting all this effort in to help these kids that are in difficult family situations and all this stuff, but then they uh, they don't, they're not grateful. They don't recognize and they do something that's really frustrating to you. And you find yourself thinking that you are irritated by this person that you don't really like them and that um, they're ungrateful for the help that you're giving. And then, then you're, oh my gosh, I'm not supposed to think like that. I'm a Christian, right? Um, and if that, if your ability to respond correctly to what God has done all the time is what is your faith is in rather than in Jesus himself, then you begin to doubt your own faith. As opposed to, for us, what Luther describes Satan as God's fool is that when you are tempted and you fall into sin, it drives you back to God's word and to the embrace of Christ right, and his promises. Because I'm not tying my faith in the promises. I'm under no illusion that Jesus did this stuff for me with some sort of trade-off that in the future, I'm going to be a better person. He just did them because he loved me, right? And full stop. So that's our that's our big thing here. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so uh, the other really interesting thing about this too, I think, is the Holy Spirit creates and works in the church, right? So I think we've probably covered this a little bit in this class that uh, you don't put God in a box, but if he puts himself in a box, you should open the box, right? And that box is called church. And he's promised to come to us in certain places in certain ways for certain purposes, right? And the Holy Spirit is the one who carries those out, right? So the reason that the word of God um, is tied to all of the acts and, and works of the church is because we believe that the Holy Spirit is the one driving the ship, right? And that we're just playing our parts, right? worshiping, I'm serving in the office of pastor, but none of the stuff that I'm giving out or sharing is mine. It's the Holy Spirit working through me to give you the stuff of, of, of Christ. Um, and as usual, there's a bunch of scripture references here. Um, feel free to peruse those on your own time. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're just getting back to like, you know, that our faith is, um, you know, a gift in through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So some people say, you know, they'll refer to the scripture, you know, we well, even know them by their fruits. So um, I've heard a lot of... <clears throat> kind of more evangelical Christian mm -hmm. say yeah. things like that. Yeah. And yeah, our fruits don't always look good, you know. <laughs> and but and but they'll like take that as well you didn't do this so well when we think of fruits of our labor, what are we thinking? If if you would name a fruit of our labor, what would that be? Would it mean um, like at work or well no like when we're referring to like the good fruits of being a Christian. Yeah. Because I think there's many layers to when people say stuff like that. I think uh, one, the, the scriptures, when they are describing the works of faith as fruit, oh. they're never, there's never a, um, a command to bear the fruit. What is described is the reality of that if the tree is connected to the life giving waters, which is Christ, <clears throat> it bears the fruit. Right. Right. So one of the distinctions there is that I don't stand in the pulpit and say, all right, you're a Christian, therefore you should do blah, right? Um, I say, because you're a Christian, we now do this, yeah, right. which seems like a, a slight shift, but it's actually really important because um, I think the other aspect that drives that home and why I think that distinction is important is the understanding of what those fruits actually are. So um the fruits that are a result of you being in Christ happened this morning when you confessed your sins and you received the trust in the promises of Christ, right? And the fact that you, you could be doing a bunch of other things this morning, yet you're here worshiping God. That's a fruit of your faith, right? But usually when, when especially in an evangelical sense, when they're talking about the fruits of your faith, they're almost exclusively thinking of things like Operation Christmas Child, which is a fruit of faith. But it can also yeah. not be a fruit of faith, right? Yeah. You can turn any supposed good deed into not a fruit of faith by the way you are internally rationalizing why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing Operation Christmas Child because I want the person at the store to ask me, why, why is a 32-year-old man buying a bunch of kids' toys? And I get to tell them, wow, I'm doing this really amazing thing 
and, and I want them to think about me as a great person, then that's not a work of faith, even though I'm doing something nice mm -hmm. and I'm doing something I ought to do, right? Um, so I think the, the typical issue that I run into with evangelicals is they, they are very quick to narrow the definition of what the sanctified life is supposed to be about. Right? Often, and unfortunately, to the exclusion of doing the very things that God specifically says to do, right? So they're much more drawn to doing a mission trip to another country to build houses and, and share the gospel, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. But if they're doing that to the neglect of like teaching the, their children the faith at home, because that's not grand and, and nobody else knows about it, mm -hmm. then they're actually sinning, right? Because God does, God sort of like you can, extrapolate that he commands you to go and serve others mm -hmm. but he doesn't give you a specific command that you must go to guatemala and build a house in this neighborhood and share the gospel with these particular people right he does give you a, an explicit command that only you can carry out to teach your children that, right and so it's the fruits of faith are much more complicated than the evangelical statements usually derive. often your first way of detecting that is if they give you one verse out of Text as the support for what they're trying to get you to do or say. Um, I always feel a little out of place when I go to evangelical conferences for that reason that <laughs> I don't buy into a lot of the, um, they do a lot of great mercy work, mm -hmm. but I often, I feel like they use that as a means of guilting people into doing the right thing as opposed to trying to point them to Christ and use like like today, I was trying to sum up all of the stuff. Like, sure, there are law statements to stewardship. You are supposed to do this, that, and the other, right? Because that's what a steward is supposed to do. The stuff's not yours. It comes from God. But the thing that ties that all together and that frees you up to actually do it is the reality that you no longer need to be concerned for yourself. Yourself is taken care of. And so the gospel has now, like, freed you to actually do the things that God wants you to do. Like, I can't, if I believe, if I don't have any sort of sense that I'm secure in an ultimate way, then my whole life is spent building myself up through accolades and reputation, through good right. job, through lots of friends, whatever it ends up that I latch on to. Um, and so we try to, as best as we can, keep the thing we latch on to just Jesus and the stuff he does, right? Um and use that as a springboard to do the things he calls us to do. But the problem is, as soon as you start getting into the territory where you're telling people they ought to do this and that, because that's just what good Christians do, then mm -hmm. inevitably and unconsciously, you start shifting your focus from Jesus to your correct response to Jesus. And that leads to <clears throat> bad places. Right? Um, and that, right. ironically, yeah. that I is mean, what yeah. Luther is rebelling against initially. So, like, through all this, you know, crazy political stuff, there are so many people, like, if you don't vote a certain way, um, that, like, an evangelical Christian might think you should vote, because I've had this problem in my own family, mm -hmm. like, with one of my siblings, that I'm not, you know, he's just so, like, that I'm not really a Christian, because I didn't vote the way he thought. He's so disappointed that I didn't vote the way he thought I should sure. vote. And I understand that, but I had my other reasons sure. for not, and I pray, like, and I don't, uh, you know, he's just, you know, accusing me of, you know. All well, kind but of even stuff. that statement in and of itself, that I don't think that you're a real Christian, is never a statement that a Christian can say to another Christian, because one, you're not judged, that's not your place, so you're actually usurping the position of Christ. Christ is the judge, and he's the judge because all of the reasons and things that we would come up with within our own heart, mm -hmm. he knows, right? Your sibling doesn't know any of those, right? They can't. You don't know theirs, right? right, right. Um, and, and so it's like I just, it's, it's well, just so that's a fairly common malady in the United States is the, the way things ought to work is your religious identity should be above your political identity and actually inform it. And what ends up happening is usually. The political identity, because it's more relevant and more immediate, takes the, the place of honor, and then your religious identity becomes in service to that, uh, and that's, that is upside down. Um, 
like there's a reason you may have noticed in our in our sanctuary we have the christian flag and the american flag mm -hmm. and the american flag is on a step below the christian flag <clears throat> and i've had i've actually had a couple of conversations with people about that um and it's but because at least it's there what at least it's there. Yeah, I mean, it, honestly, if I had my way, I don't think we should have American flags in any of our churches. Because have, what goes on up there yeah, is really has nothing to do with your responsibilities as a citizen of the country. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a responsible citizen of the country. You should. And it's okay to like the country you live in. I think that's a healthy attitude. But um, what you're doing, what we're doing in there, what's being done to us there, <laughs> is of a different kingdom. It's not of this kingdom. It's of, a, it's of the one to come. Huh? <laughs> but still, well, we have no. But I mean that. I mean that's sort of I, I related understand. to the message today, right? That like what used to you is America when you're dead. Right. It's nothing, right? It passes away, right? And even by earthly empire standards, America is really young, right? And so, and then, like that is sort of the basis of the vision of the Christian is understanding. Um, I think you know it's on my. Well, maybe it is. I can't. I'll, I mean, I'll show it to you after class if it's the background on this computer. But that's one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis. Is he says, "If I find within myself desires with nothing in this world to satisfy, it stands to reason I was made for another world." Right. And and what the Christian life is about realizing is that, like, I am here. I'm in the world, but this is not my place. Right. And so my vision is always on where my place is. And that's, that was sort of the, the heart of what Jesus was teaching in the gospel today is that like, you're, you're going to be very tempted to put all of your energy and your efforts into things that are going to do you no good when your soul is required. Right? And it is very easy to get obsessed with those things in America as a society is one of those things. Right? Um, and because it could end at any moment, it really could. Right? Whether it's when Jesus returns and then borders and, and nationalities are of no consequence any longer because a new kingdom is, is at hand, or whether it's through earthly warfare and the destruction of one society and the, or the rulership of another or whatever, right? Um, because imagine being somebody who's a Christian who grows up in Soviet Russia, where you're not allowed to practice your faith. You can't put any hope in your own society. But you're not despairing over that, ultimately, because you know that your hope isn't in this world. Right? That's how. That's why Christianity grows in places of strife and turmoil. Um, anyways, we got a little off track there. But, um, but yeah, I mean that. So the political thing is a bit tricky because um, one of the ways that I I think is wise for Christians to understand. Like you're never going to hear specific instructions on how to vote on certain things here, um, unless they're moral issues primarily, right? So the Bible doesn't say anything about what the best economic plan is or the best setup for a government is or anything like that. Like here, you're never going to hear me say capitalism is the best way, bar none, right? Um, but you will say me say that you will hear me say that abortion is a sin, because before that was a political issue, it was a moral issue. So the Bible will speak to things that were moral issues that have turned into political issues, but things that are purely political issues are, and, and a lot of times, especially right now within the Christian church, there's a lot of confusion as to what qualifies as a moral issue. Right? Mm -hmm. So the only thing, like I speak from borrowed authority and really Christians in general, we all speak from borrowed authority. So I can only say things that the authority that I'm borrowing from actually speaks to. Right? So, if it says that, like, even before you were you were born, I knew you and I had plans for you, then abortion is, is a morally wrong thing because life is precious. And we also have examples. And so that's just like an example of some of the distinctions. There. Okay. Um, lastly, the, what is the outcome of this Holy Spirit work is the resurrection of the body and life of Christ. Right? So that's the outcome of the work of the church. Um, so you and I are vessels. Right? Um, it's not our work, but work that's being done through us. Because the work that, that we're doing for others has already been completed in us. Right? So you're not going around doing good works so that your salvation is completed. Your salvation is already completed in Jesus. And because of that, you're now going out so that others may too come to know that Christ has completed their salvation. 
All right. Next section, baptism. So um, just a real quick introduction to uh, sacraments. So we have two sacraments in the Lutheran Church. Does anybody know what those are? Baptism is one. And what's the second one? Supper. Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, Sacrament of the Altar, whatever you want to call it. Right? Why are those our two sacraments? Why don't we have seven? The other church has seven. So why did when Luther was wanting to reform the church, why did he take the other five out? Wow. The other five are um, confirmation, marriage, uh, penance, confession, anointing, anointing, Yeah, there's a word for that. Are these are any of these bad things? One that is, I think. That's not a good one because that blurs the lines between law and gospel. Right? It attaches a condition to your identity in Christ. So we we think that one is really against the scriptural message of the gospel. But is there anything wrong with confession or marriage or confirmation or anointing or healing? There are Lutheran pastors that do that. A lot of them are in the, the Northeast. There is much more of a, a Catholic environment there. And so the Lutheran churches that are there are much more high church. And some of them do that. I had a class with one and I had uh, done something bizarre. I'm in, in the middle of my hand. I was picking up my luggage at the airport because I was doing a two week class in urban on urban ministry in New York, and I pulled something in the middle of my hand somehow. Mm -hmm. and it was bothering me, and it started to swell up the next day. And he, he saw me messing with it, and, I, and he said, "What's wrong?" I said, "I don't know. My my hand is is hurting me. I'm not sure what's going on." And like he immediately grabbed my hand and put oil on it, and prayed over it. And I was just sort of like, "I'm I am from the Midwest. I wasn't used to that." <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, there's nothing wrong with him doing. It. And for some people, it's a powerful visual to the to the to the, the good kind act of somebody praying. Um, so why? What's the difference between these and those? Um, well, for okay, so there's the forgiveness of sins in baptism and communion. Okay. And there's a. Um, like a physical thing being used along with it, like the water okay. in the baptism uh -huh. and the bread and wine in the communion. And really? Yeah, those, those are the only two that I know. How do you know those two? Who told you that? Oh, I learned that in confirmation. Well, <laughs> there you go. Well, good. You had a good teacher. <laughs> But you know, from the Bible, I mean, it's yeah, in the and Bible. the Bible is what? God's, God's word. word, right? So, um, can you point to a particular passage of scripture that commands confirmation or that commands marriage in a way that attaches like a necessity to them or confession or anointing? No, right? Now, these are all good things, right? Marriage is, is, is elevated in scripture and encouraged, but if someone lives their whole life single and is never married, can they still be saved? Of course, right? Um, what if you never went through a formal confirmation because you didn't go to church when you were a kid and you just did a short, uh, swift version like what we're doing here, and uh, there's no like major right, you didn't get a robe, get to wear a robe and, and have your own confirmation verse or whatever, um, can you still be saved? Yeah, right? Um, so the difference between this category here and these two is that these are things that we believe that God's word explicitly commands the church to do as part of what we've been commanded to do that's necessary for the salvation of other people, right? Um, so 
Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is a great example for baptism. <clears throat> once, what, what is the natural response of the, the Ethiopian eunuch once the scriptures are opened up to him and he learns that Jesus is the Messiah and that he died on the cross to save him from his sins? His, uh, his initial reaction to that is, is there any reason why I can't be baptized right now? Right? Because that was the visible promise then of all that great stuff he just learned about being applied to him. And it was something God commanded his followers to do, right? Uh, which is just so funny to me in the evangelical circles. They do, they're always talking about great commission, great commission, great commission. And it's like they just heard the, the part about sharing the love of Jesus and then none of the stuff that came after, which is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them the things I've managed, right? And so uh, baptism is tied to the beginnings of faith. Right. Now, um, like in, we would we say that because the Holy Spirit works through baptism, baptism does create faith. Right? So that's why we baptize in right? the creation of this gift from God. Um, but can somebody who believes in Jesus but dies before they're able to be baptized be saved? The baptism is in service to the promise of Jesus. Right? And so for the infinite creates faith and brings you to Christ through the authority given by parents as an adult. It's not a sign of your outward confession, but it's a, it's a promise that has given, been given a visible element that you can cling to. Right? Um, and so baptism is something that creates and safeguards your faith in Christ, right? But it's still the faith in Christ that does the actual saving, okay? Um, so uh, a lot of times we get hung up on that and people will say, well, yeah, but what if some so-and-so professes faith in Christ and then they die and they didn't get to be baptized? Are they still saved, right? And see, then you shouldn't really make people get baptized. It's like, wait a minute. Like, we're making, we're, we are like in, we're, well, we're not making people get baptized. Like, if you tell me you're not baptized, I'm not going to, like, drag you down the hall and <laughs> shove your head in water and say the words, right? Um, but it is a command that we are to do that as followers of Christ. When we share the gospel, we are to <coughs> implore them that it's a necessary thing. For them to do. Um, because it's one of the ways in which God wishes to place his name on them. Right? And that's that's the joy of baptism, right? The joy of baptism is that whenever you're having a terrible period of your life, maybe you've strayed from the church and you're returning back and you're wondering a lot of times what happens when people do that is they want to get baptized again. And in our church, if you asked me that, I'd say, you're already baptized, aren't you? Well, the baptism wasn't because it, because they think that in some ways it's their like commitment to God that they're making when they're baptized. They think they need to recommit. And, and our understanding is that, no, it's actually God's commitment to you. And he's been committed to you the whole time. Right? So you, there's no, it doesn't need to be a recommitting of God. Right? He's been committed to you. Uh, and then when things are going rough and maybe you're not feeling the spirit or whatever, um, then you have a visible thing that you can point to, like a visible historical event in your life, say like, you know what? You're right, Satan. I did this terrible thing, or I didn't do this thing I ought to, but you know what? I'm a child of God. He told me that I'm my God. Um, and then the Lord's Supper as well, right? Is that something that from the very beginnings, our understanding is the early church, this was like the way that they organized their church service was a service of the word where the scriptures were read, and then a celebration of the Holy Supper. Um, and Paul, Paul writes his letter to the Corinthians about that, right? Because they're having disagreements on how exactly this should be going. Right? Some of them sound even common. There are people that are like drinking all the wine and not leaving it for other people. Uh, so I always have this funny image of somebody going up and grabbing the common cup and just draining it. And then everybody else is like, uh, what? Um, <laughs> 
but so these are we have these as sacraments because salvation and the vehicles of salvation forgiveness of sins um, are attached to them promises of salvation are attached to them they're explicitly commanded um, in the scriptures <laughs> And then there's the physical representation, which is another good example of why the, the, the Christian faith is not divided by like matter and spirit, right? God is still using his creation to carry out supernatural things. Right? He does that in the very person of Jesus who becomes an incarnate, truly incarnate man to work the supernatural salvation of creation, right? And then it's reflected in the gifts and promises attached to the water and the word of baptism and the body and blood and bread and wine of the Lord. All right, so that's just kind of a general in introduction to the sacrament. So baptism, what is baptism? Um, baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. So if I just threw like a cup of water on your face, that's not a baptism. Um, what makes it baptism is the water, the command, and the word. Right? Um, and which is that word of God? So what's the what's the scriptural connection for this teaching? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? So that's a command to the church. <clears throat> um, what about, uh, is there a specific a form like do i have to throw you in a lake do i have to dunk your whole body underwater can i shoot you with a water gun can i you know is there a particular way that that's done no um there are some people that ins there are some groups in christianity that insist that it has to be like a total immersion um we could do a total immersion although it's, i've never seen one done in the Lutheran church they may do, like, if there's a baptism on a retreat and there's a lake there, they may do it in a lake, or somebody may want to do it in a lake or something like that. Yeah, that's fine. I would do it. Um, typically here, though, we have the baptismal font, and we get water from that and put it on their head. And we, our, our tradition, um, and this isn't right or wrong, it's just the way we do it, uh, is to put, like, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, but you could just do it once. And it still be a um, so, uh, so we don't get hung up on the, the how of the washing uh, goes. Um, <clears throat> that's why, uh, as an aside, I think somebody asked, maybe it was Cheryl, asked about this a couple weeks ago, like when I make the sign of the cross, that's a reminder of my baptism because I'm baptizing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, that's, but you don't have to do that. But that's when people do that. That's generally why. Or so well, there's probably also a lot of people who just do it because everybody else is doing it and they have no idea why that. I always just thought it was a Catholic thing. Right. Well, I think that oh, there are a lot of people that I think do. Um, but that's where that Catholic thing came from. Um, <clears throat> um, okay. Yeah. So, and I talked about means of grace even before. Or no. I teach so many classes, I can never remember which one I said. Means of grace. So this, these are part of the, the means of grace theology we have, which is like part of God's mercy in Jesus is that he attaches invisible, like the powerful invisible promises of God to visible things. Um, and he, so he gives like, oh, the Holy Spirit is this vast grand divine thing that I can't control and I don't know how it works. Um, so how am I supposed to relate to it? And in, and in God's mercy, it says, well, that is true. But I'm going to give you some places and some things where the Holy Spirit promises to be. Right? So when you read the Bible, God has promised the Holy Spirit is there through the words, right? In baptism, God has promised the Holy Spirit is there. In the Lord's Supper, God has promised the Holy Spirit is there. Uh, so those are our means of grace. So if you're ever lost and feeling like God is not around you, some people feel that very acutely. And open up your Bible. Remember your baptism. Go to church. Okay. Um, that's one of the reasons why we gather here on Sunday. And we're not, like, as many people speculated, by this time this year, we were all going to be sitting at home watching church on the couch. And, you know, airmailing communion to 
turns out that's not the way we're wired. And God knows that. So he created worship and reflection of our, of our created being. Because he likes his creation, so he used it. Um, okay. Um, why baptism? So in the order of holy baptism and Lutheran worship, the minister addresses the congregation in these words. Our Lord commanded baptism, saying it to his disciples in the last chapter of Matthew. Uh, so this is a statement that he makes after establishing all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, do this. Right? And baptism is one of the things he says. Um, and then the apostles, I think it's Peter, says this promise is for you and your children. And um, we also learn from the word of God that we're all conceived and born sinful and so are in need of forgiveness. We would be forever lost unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to atone for the sin of the whole world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Um, yeah. Is there a difference between infant baptism and eternal life? Do they mean the same thing? They mean the same thing. Okay. Um, and then blessings of baptism. Uh, oh, there's so much good stuff here, but we don't have time to go into all. Uh, the blessings of baptism. So what benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare, which are these words. Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Um, so notice that in the condemnation side, it doesn't say whoever does not believe in is baptized. It's whoever does not believe, right? Um, but it does, it, it's, all, it's one of those weird scripture things. It does always attach baptism to new faith. So it's like the implied action of new faith. Um, so whenever people ask me about that and we try to do this, these splitting hair hypotheticals, I always say, like, what is your motivation for pushing against the idea of baptism? Like you're a new Christian and baptism is like God's visible means of assuring you that that promise is yours by claiming you as his own. And you're standing here saying, yeah, but do I really need to be baptized to be saved? It's like, that's like saying like, I'm starving to death, but do I really need to eat dinner right now? Why would you not? That's what it's for, right? Um, so, but everybody gets hung up on these really, you know, bizarre vacuumed hypothetical situations about like yeah but if this happens but this doesn't happen then what right um so it's usually a, a, a not a great question any questions about the benefits of baptism if i, I would write it on your handout if you've got one or just on anything you write notes on right second kings chapter five i think is one of the best stories and one of the best accounts in the bible where um it really goes through, I think, the normal human reaction to the promise of baptism, and that's the healing of Naaman the leper. And he's told to go wash in the Jordan River. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Jordan River. Maybe some of you have been there. It's a gross river. <laughs> and he came from a place that has much nicer rivers. And so when he's told to go wash and be cleansed of his leprosy, he says, like, I thought you were going to wave your hands over my skin or something. I could have gone and washed myself in the rivers where I'm from, they're way better than the Jordan. And then he's reminded, it's not about that. It's because the servant of God has shared God's word and his command is to do this. So don't get hung up on the earthly details of what he's asked you to do. Just do what he says. And lo and behold, he goes and washes in the gross and nasty Jordan River. And he's cleansed of his incurable lifelong disease of leprosy. Right? Um, so I always like that story because he has kind of the same reaction I think that a rational person would. And you're like, yeah, I know. When the pastor, he threw that little piddle of water on the baby's head three times and said those words. The baby has been forgiven of its sins, has received the promise of eternal life, and is now a child of God. Okay. Um, uh, the power of baptism. How can water do such great things? Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts in this word of God. Without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and the washing of the new birth of the Holy Spirit. Um, as, as St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. 
so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. So when we baptize babies, do the babies have faith in the promises that they're being given? No. They're probably just thinking, I'm tired. I'm ready. <laughs> Wham. Right? So why do we baptize them? They receive the Holy Spirit. They receive the Holy Spirit. So it's the work of God. So where is the faith and the promises coming from when we baptize a baby? From the parents. From the parents, right? The one people that God has given the authority to speak on behalf of matters of faith for children. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the authority. So if like, if uh, a grandparent comes to me and they say, can you baptize my grandson? My children are no longer believers and they won't do it. Um, I'm not going to like, if she smuggles the kid away for uh, we're gonna go get ice cream so we can go and they come to church and they try to tell me to do the baptism i will say no and i'll say no because the grandma has not been given the authority to do that she does not have the authority to speak on behalf of the child now it's different if the like the parents they die in a car accident tragic and she then becomes the primary guardian and caregiver of the children She's not just doing that legally. Spiritually speaking, she's now the, the God representative authority in their life. Um, so, and that does happen, unfortunately. I have had situations where I had like a 12-year-old who his grandparents told me he wants to be baptized, but his parents don't want to. Um, and if he came to me of his own and said that, then I would baptize him, even if his parents didn't want him to be, because they don't have the authority to prevent him from doing that. Um, so, you know, it can get kind of tricky, but um, that's why parents are the only people who can bring their, their infants to the waters of baptism. And they're the ones that actually in the right, they will speak on behalf of the child. So, in, you know, in confirmation, I ask, do you renounce the devil in all his works and all his ways? In baptism, I'll say, who, who desires to this child to be baptized? And then I'll ask them confessional questions and I'm not expecting the two-month-old to answer those. I'm expecting the parents to. Right? So the faith and the promises for infants comes from their parents. <clears throat> Which is why it is quite significant that there's a battle going on between who gets to teach values to our children between parents and the state. Because the, the scriptures do speak pretty strongly to the state does not have the authority to overrule parents when it comes to what goes on with their children. So the Bible does speak pretty clearly on that. Um, so what does baptism indicate? It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So is baptism your salvation insurance policy? It's not. Don't need one. What's the word in that meaning that I just read that indicates that it's not? So the first line there. Indicates a sense of time. Daily. Daily. Right? So it like it isn't that you can say, well, I was baptized, so I can go and do whatever I want. Right? Um, that's not the way baptism works. Baptism is a daily regenerative thing. It's tied to a particular point in time, but it's sort of a living thing sustained by God. And if you reject his, the way he sustains that by cutting yourself off from faith, no longer trust him in the promises of baptism, like for whatever reason, the scriptures indicate that those promises of God then become void because you no longer believe. Um, and it's the same with your basic belief in your own salvation, right? That if you, if the devil or the world or your own simple flesh convinces you that Jesus really didn't die for your sins, for whatever reason, God has indicated that, that he has allowed us to basically prevent him from saving us uh, through our disbelief in the promise. Uh, so it's the same with baptism. So that's another reason that I typically don't, like, not only would I not have the grandma baptize a child because she's working around the authority of parents, but also because that desire stems from this thought that baptism is just like a one-time deal that assures you of salvation with um, When I do a baptism here, I want to meet with the parents, and I'm going to teach them about what baptism is, 
and that it's not just this one-off thing that if you just come today and have your kid baptized, then you never come to church again. It's really, you know, not a good plan, right? <laughs> Can the Holy Spirit work through that baptism and create and sustain the faith in the child despite its parents? Yes, but not a great plan, not something that we should encourage as a church. Right? Uh, now, if I do have the option of I'm going to baptize this person and I'm pretty sure they're never going to come back versus never baptize them at all, I'm going to baptize them. But I'm also going to be straight with them and say, you know, this isn't baptism. Baptism is a wondrous promise that you are God's child, but you can reject the promise. So it's not just like a thing that you get done and then you're like, all right, I'm good. I can go do whatever I want. Okay. Um, because it, it is this representative of this daily dying to self. Right? The baptism is actually meant to be like a flood of drowning of the old Adam. Most people think of the water as just like the washing away of dirt. It's not. It's the, it is the drowning of the old sinful self and the recreation of a new creation in Jesus. So um, that's where uh, I erased it, but that's where you go from a sinner to a child of God. That's what happens in that. Um, <clears throat> and the reason it's important that that's done daily is the old Adam will get at you daily. We all know this, right? There's new temptations every morning. There's new temptations not to do the things you should and to do the things you should not. All right, any questions about baptism as, as we sort of practice it in the weekend? There's a lot more to that that we could dig into, but we don't have time. So um, I don't think I had covered that yet in the catechism class that I'm going to finish. That's much more in depth. So we're, we'll be getting into baptism in a lot more detail uh, at that point if you're interested in that. Um, and for the creed, that one is up on our YouTube channel, so you can watch from the spring Bible study if you weren't able to go to that, the, the real in-depth look at the creeds. Okay, this is a fun one. The Office of the Keys and the Lord's Supper. So we'll start with the Office of the Keys because most people have no idea what that is. Um, does I anybody told, know? I the told them all. Are? It was a, it's a oh. room. It's a room with a bunch of keys. Ah. <laughs> See, I know. Yes, and when you become a pastor and you're ordained, they, they come down from heaven. <laughs> This glowing ring of keys that only I can see and only I can use. Um, what is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. So it's a special authority given to the church. And the word church there is capitalized. So what is that word referring to? Is it referring to Ascension Lutheran Church? Is it referring to a building? People. People, okay, so it's people, not a building. What, what people? Christian people. Christian people. How do we know? Which one? Is this talking about the visible church or the invisible church? The invisible church. Right? Uh, for the same reason that your sibling can't say, oh, I don't think you're a great Christian, because they don't know your heart. I also, like people sitting upstairs could be not part of the invisible church. Oh, well, I know. I don't know their heart, right? They could just be deceiving me and sitting in there and pretending like they like the things that we're saying. I don't know why anybody would do that. It just wouldn't show up, but um, it's possible, right? <clears throat> so this is talking about anytime you see the, the word church all, uh, capitalized, and it's not referring to like a, like Ascension Lutheran Church or St. Paul's Lutheran Church. It's referring to the invisible church. Is the invisible church only Lutherans? No, right? Um, and that's an important thing to recognize as well, that uh by becoming a Lutheran, you're not saying, well, sorry, the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Roman Catholics, they're all just, they're in trouble. They're screwed, right? So we got to make sure we get them on the straight and narrow. Um, no, what you're saying is that you believe this is the most faithful confession of the Christian faith. Um, so why do I want you here? Well, that's why. I think this is the most faithful 
replace V. Um, but Jesus is president of Baptist churches, he's president of the Roman Catholic churches, he's president of you know, whatever denomination of Christianity there is. Anywhere where the word of God is being read or preached faithfully. But we would say that like if you're a Baptist, even if you've got a great preacher, you're missing out on some of the more um, visible gifts by not having a sacrament of the altar and by not baptizing infants, right? Not that you're ruining everybody's salvation, but that it's less secure because it's less faithful, right? So that's that's the difference. Um, uh, where was this written? Um, so this is where uh, St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If for you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So what do you believe according to these words? I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. Okay, so the office of the keys is spoken in particular through the office of the pastor, typically. Um, one, because the pastor is usually more aware of the spiritual situation in general of the congregation as a whole than its own individual members. Now, that's not always the case. You may know more about a particular person than the pastor. Um, but part of the responsibility of the church and then the pastor as the visible, like the visible person who's called to carry out what the church ought to do is to use the word of God, not only for the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of the gospel, but also to bring the law to bear for those who are, in, who are unrepentant. Now, why is that a good thing for the church to do? Because it sounds mean. Because what that looks like practically is, if I know that you're married and you are living with another person and sexually active with them while still married, you will not get communion at this church. If I know that, and I know that you know it's not the right thing to do, and yet you still refuse to change, you will not get communion. Isn't that just me? Huh? <laughs> what makes that not just me and exclusive? What's going on in that person's life? They have unrepentant sin, right? And why is that such a serious thing that I would bar them from communion for that? They are in extreme spiritual danger. And our job as, as brothers and sisters in Christ is when you see one of your fellow believers walking towards a buzzsaw, you don't just say, you to you, <laughs> have fun. No, it's totally fine, right? It's not, right? That's only loving in the eyes of our culture because our culture has no scope or vision for what ultimate reality is going to be. But if you believe the ultimate reality of the scriptures, which is if you're an unrepentant sinner, which is essentially what you're saying to God is, like, actually, I'm the one who makes the rules. So I agree on 99% of the rules you've set, but not this one. And so instead of saying you're God and I'm going to listen to you, I'm God and I'm going to do what I want. Right? So you're rejecting God and his position and his authority, even if it's something small. Right? Um, and so it isn't actually the particular sin that's the issue, right? This is why there is self-examination before you come to communion. You're encouraged to ask yourself, do I believe in the promises of God? Am I a sinner in need of repentance? Uh, or, sorry, of forgiveness. So sometimes when you hear me pray for communion, I'll specifically say repentant. Grant us repentant faith. Faith that we can turn away from the wrong that we do and confess it to you. Why don't we have confession absolution at the end of the service? It's so that you can be prepared to receive communion by having examined yourself and acknowledged that I'm a poor, miserable sinner in need of the mercy of God. And communion is the visible representation of that mercy and the gift of the body and blood of Jesus. And so 
the state of unrepentance is the key, right? Like even if it's some small lie that I haven't told anybody about, and they don't know, if I'm okay with that and unrepentant of it, I'm in a dangerous spiritual situation because I've made myself God. Right? Um, now, often where it comes out in the church publicly is especially if it's a publicly known thing, right? So this is why like it's such a big deal currently in the current climate of our culture, why there are a lot of people in the Catholic church who want to excommunicate President Biden or Nancy Pelosi because they're public figures that are publicly advocating for things that the church publicly disavows or claims are sinful, right? Um, so for example, like I would lose my ordination status in the LCMS if I went on TV and started publicly advocating for same-sex marriage. I would no longer be able to be a pastor in LCMS church, right? Because I'm openly, unrepentantly advocating for something that denounces God. Um, so what that looks like, it's very, very rare that this is invoked in a, in a church. Most of this goes on internally, right? And most of it goes on in one-on-one -on -one relationships between husbands and wives and friends and siblings and that sort of thing. Because while the pastor is the mouthpiece of the church and this particular responsibility is given to the pastor when it comes to being a proper steward of the gifts of God through the church, it's also a responsibility given to the priesthood of all believers when it comes to like, if your friend wrongs you and they're unrepentant about it, then there should be consequences that you give them, not because you want to be mean, but because you want them to repent. Right? So if somebody has wronged you and they're not sorry about it, then you say, no, I'm not coming over your house for dinner. Why not? You've done this thing to me and you have yet to apologize. And I'm concerned because I think you know it's wrong. Right? Until then, you know, I'd love to come to your house for dinner. I'd love to have our relationship restored, but that the ball's in your court. Right? Um, that's the office of the keys, right? Now, formally in the church, that's going to be borne out through the pastor. Right? So, like on Sunday morning, what this isn't is an invitation for you to go up and say, Joey is an unrepentant sinner. Pastor, you shouldn't let him come to communion. Okay? That's not what this is. What this is, is the church collectively sort of monitoring itself so that we don't get into the spiritual dangerous, spiritually dangerous territory of unrepentance. Okay? Um, I, in my experience, both as a pastor and as a lay person, I have only known of one instance of this being done publicly in a church. And, it's, and you don't shame the person. But the pastor will go to them and say, just so you know, I'm aware of this and you're continuing to do it. So you can come up to the rail, but I will not give you. So you can either stay seated in, in, your, in your seat or if you want to come up, I won't give you communion. And here's why. And I, and I urge you to repent of that. As soon as you repent of it, I would, be, I would love to be able to give you communion, but I can't. Um, and so that... That's usually the way it would be born. And most of the time, the congregation as a whole is not going to know about that stuff. Right? Uh, if I am put in a position, now, if they're very public about it, so if it's something like, let's say if somebody in our congregation is a local politician and they do something publicly or encourage something publicly that goes against our confession of faith, then people may know why you know, Joe so-and-so is no longer getting communion in church they may be aware of the situation but most of the time people aren't aware of that stuff which is good because that that makes things way messier than they need to be. does that make sense is that how it works and it's important to, to keep in mind because there's a lot of things that we're going to get into and that you, you may experience here because we're in a biblically based church there are going to be some things that you'll see and hear that at first blush do not seem loving according to what our culture says but it's important to understand the context they're given in the scriptures and why they are in fact loving, right? So like not tolerating unrepentance seems like a hateful thing because our culture is obsessed with just letting people do whatever they want. Right? Well, here it's actually the most loving thing you can do because you're 
not just watching somebody do something that is spiritually self-destructive, right? And, and because you care about them, you're called to risk that relationship for their own benefit, for their well-being, right? You're not, you're not called to just be like righteously indignant for the sake of it, right? You're called to compassion. And part of compassion at times is speaking the truth. And sometimes the truth is not pleasant. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so that's kind of the office of the keys. Uh, there's a lot more to that, um, but that's the basics of it. The, the flip side of that same coin, we'll just wrap up with this, is the confession piece, um, which is on page 28 of the outline I gave you today. <clears throat> so Luther actually um, would prefer that we still practice private confession. He just didn't he just disagree that it was a sacrament of the church, but it's a very healthy spiritual practice. Um, so uh, I'll usually tell people on an individual basis, if you do want to come and do private confession absolution, I'd be more than happy to do that. We we have we have rights for doing that. It's different than the Catholic Church, and then I'm not going to say, okay, say five Hail Marys and three Our Fathers, and you're good to go. Right at the end of it, what it'll say is, I'll ask, do you believe that my forgiveness is Christ's forgiveness? In other words. Leave the office of the keys that he's given me the authority to speak on his behalf in this regard. And if you say yes, and I say, well, let it be done to you as you believe. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the only thing I say after that, unless we have a little discussion, is go in peace. Because your sins are forgiven. Um, so I actually do plan maybe next year establishing a set time during the week. Say, like, I'm available from from two to four um, for private confession for anybody who would like it um, and have it as an open invitation because uh, it can be a very good and powerful um, spiritual exercise because maybe you've got something that's been weighing on your mind and you've gone to church and you've done the sort of in my heart public joint confession about it but it still is eaten away at your mind um, naming it out loud to somebody else in a safe environment uh, is very powerful and getting rid of that sometimes. Uh, so I would encourage you to think about that if you find yourself in that situation where um, you've gone to church, you know, you're not doubting the, the promises of God, but for whatever reason, this thing is just really stuck, stuck on your mind. Um, and because that's, that's the work of your sinful flesh and the devil, he wants you to dwell on that stuff because then he can kind of slowly claw away at you. Um, do, I promise I won't make it weird. Mm. It's kind of the, the opposite, you know, I'm, sometimes during church, my mind wanders and, I'm sorry. What? I know. And so, you know, believe, I might be at that particular time of confession, I, you know, I might not even be like, oh, I got to mow the grass. Yeah. And so then is it sinful for me to go up to take communion when I haven't, um, not necessarily yeah not necessarily you know? so i would say like the one of the temptations that, that i you don't want to create a, a feeling of sanctimonious seriousness about everything when on sunday morning because it isn't it isn't that i mean god has a sense of humor and, and he's he's gracious so he's not you know he's not counting pennies on you there um but i would say that the, that is one way that the devil works is through distraction He's um, so good at it. He, he, is, he is. And, and you're, you're, there's a part of your own self that's working against you in that regard. So, um, no, I mean, that happens to me, and I'm running the circle. So, um, <clears throat> so that I, one of the things that I also encourage people to do, I especially encourage it to, to the confirmation students when they're going to be taking, starting to take communion, is on your way up, you can also do that. So make, make it a point the time that you're you're waiting to go up either you're sitting in the pew and you're waiting for your turn to go or when you're walking up to go like just just some simple questions like do i believe i'm a sinner yes do i believe that that i'm saved by grace through what jesus has done yes is this one of those things that jesus has done and has given me yes and it takes 10 seconds to go through that and even less when you're not saying it but just think about it, right? um and those are our ways of, but your general <laughs> And most of the time, I'd say your general posture towards communion is the important thing. Like, do you recognize that communion is a meal for sinful people who are in need of God's grace and that are repentant of the, the wrong that they've done? Right. As long as your 
your posture towards communion is that. What's really being warned against is somebody who is taking communion as if it does nothing, or somebody who's taking communion as if they don't need it, or uh, like I, I actually did have a conversation in my previous church. There was the guy who came. I think he had like very high functioning, but on the spectrum. And uh, he told me that he believed he didn't sin. Like since he became a Christian, that he was he was now no longer a sinner. And I said, well, okay. Um, I, we disagree, and, and I listed out why we disagree. Uh, but if that's if that's still what you believe, then you don't need communion. Communion isn't for you. Communion is for people who who need forgiveness. Right. So if you're right, then you don't need communion. Right. Now I think you're not right. I think that you are a sinner. Um, you're a redeemed sinner, but uh, you need this. So, uh, but until he, and the time I was there, he never changed his mind on it. So he never got communion. You can't. You know, now, is that if you, you know, suspect he was on the spectrum, is that something that he, uh, he wasn't accountable for? Yeah. Like, or, I mean, or he was, his, his, his ability, you know, not he wasn't, ability, he wasn't, uh, I mean, you could tell by talking to him that he was capable of making those decisions. Okay. Um, because um, even when people aren't disabled, you never know the degree to which people have been screwed up by uh, experiences. Some people have right. had religious cult experiences that have put very bizarre things in their head uh, in a way that's very difficult to get rid of. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, that's it for uh, today. Let's close with, uh, let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good questions today, guys. We'll see you next week. It has not come in yet. Not yet. Okay. I did order it this week, though. All right, so it's on its way. <laughs> I apologize before it was because I forgot to order.